never done anything like this before. Uh, what makes me qualified? Absolutely nothing. The only thing is uh, I went to Israel with my husband. We went with Brian Haynes of Bay Area Church and we had this amazing experience there. We got to go to the pool of Bethesda and that's what our lesson's going to be over today. So Carrie thought it was just a good idea that maybe I give it a shot. So uh, honestly, pretty nervous. I might shake a little bit, but you know, we're just going <laughs> to allow the Holy Spirit to take over and we're just going to dig in deep. So um, the first thing that we're going to do in John chapter 5, we're going to read the entire section of the healing at the pool. I read out of the NIV. I'm an NIV girl. I know that some of you guys are uh, NLT and that's okay. Just uh, bear with me. Sometime later, Jesus went down to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, is a pool in which an Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned and learned that he had been there for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Well, I'm trying to get in. Someone else goes down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up your mat and walk? And the man, was, the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple, and he said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. Okay, so that's our story. We're going to break it down into verses, and so we're going to start with the verse 1, obviously. And I'll read it again. Sometimes later, Jesus walked down to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, we're not really sure which festival it was. Um, if you've never studied the Jewish festivals, they are absolutely fascinating. They're so super cool. But for those of us that haven't studied them before, in Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, um, the people were mandated by God to take a pilgrimage to the temple three times a year. This is what everyone did. This is what all the families did. They traveled in packs. It was called a pilgrimage because they came from all over the land to the Jewish temple to worship. And so um, a well-known story that you might think of is whenever Jesus was a kid and he got lost. Uh, you guys remember that story? It's pretty well-known. Um, and they found him in the temple. And I always thought, like, how could you lose your kid? How could you travel that far? And there was like a sometime like, well, like I said, they traveled in packs. So they might've went with a whole bunch of family there and to travel back with a whole bunch of family. So maybe Mary and Joseph thought, oh, well, he's just playing with the kids later, you know, down the pack, or maybe with his aunt and the uncle or something of that nature. And so whenever they came back, and they found him, and he was speaking with authority in the temple. And speaking with authority, what that would have meant was that he knew the Torah backwards and forwards. Like, you couldn't catch him in a wrong thing. And everybody was amazed at that because he was a little child. And so, uh, my favorite part of that story is whenever it says, Mary saw him, and 
although they were angry that, you know, he put them through this because they were super scared, she took these things and she stored them in her heart. Oh, I, I just like to imagine her worry and her anger when she fell. And, but she was, he was so passionate about God and his Lord and he was teaching all these people already. I mean, how could you just not love that? Um, <laughs> there's one time that um, my husband and I, we have a daughter and uh, she was about three years old and we made a trip to Walmart. And so I thought that he had her and he thought that I had had her and she came up and she came up missing and we were so scared. We locked down Walmart. Everybody was there was looking for her and we ended up finding her. Uh, she had taken the toilet paper and, and made a bed and then she took a wall of toilet paper and put it in front of her. <laughs> and so we, one of the workers had found her there asleep. And, oh gosh, I mean, as scary as it was, I can look back on it now and kind of laugh because, uh, and I remember it, like I stored it in my heart because I thought, what three-year-old needs a nap so bad that she's going to make a pallet and then she's going to wall it up for nobody to mess with her so she could have her nap. Um, and so, yeah, this is a funny story to me and it just reminded me of that. And then, so we're going to move along to, to verse two. And so uh, verse two says, Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, is a pool, in which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Okay, so what's cool about Bethesda is this. It was completely lost. Probably around the seventh century after the Arab conquest, no one can find it. And it was so specific in the word, right by the Sheep's Gate, which is north of the temple, it should have been really super easy to find for the people. Everybody was looking for this Pentagon shape. Well, it wasn't until 1888, to be exact, that the site of Bethesda was discovered by Dr. Conrad Stick. Before that, scholars had been very skeptical about it. A lot of skeptics proved that the Bible wasn't real because it was that detailed, then we should have been able to find it by now. And what, <laughs> what made it so hard to find was square shaped. It wasn't a pentagon at all. Okay, so this is a model that appeared what it would have looked like in 70 AD. So you can see the four colonnades the outside perimeter of a rectangle. Well, in the middle, there is another colonnade which would have made the fifth described in scripture. It divided the pool of Bethesda into two pools. There was an upper that filled with rainwater and there was a dam in the middle, the fifth colonnade, and it, the rainwater would spill into the lower pool. When the priest would open the dam, the water would rush in, hence the stirring of the water described in scripture. And here is the illustration of how far it was away from the temple. See, it wasn't far at all, maybe about 50 yards. And so um, it's just proof, and I love that. The cultural context of the Pool of Bethesda isn't what you might think. This was a healing center dedicated to the god of healing or medicine called Asclepius. The ill and the disabled would congregate here and they would drink and bathe in the waters of the Sclepion and then sleep within these walls. They slept on mats laid out in the section of the inner sanctum of the temple. And Asclepius was an ancient Greek god and he was a hero of medicine. And so all of these people that were waiting at the pool that it talks about in here, all of these people, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed, they were waiting for Asclepius to heal them, not God. And so here again, we have the Israelites and their slippage into this Hellenism. And what Hellenism means, it's just the, the seepage of Greek culture into Jewish culture. Like the Jewish still had their faith, but they also started to kind of believe more in the idols and the idols of self. And so they really kind of thought that this, this Asclepius was going to heal them. And Asclepius, he can be seen here in this statue. This statue is a Roman statue, and it uh, actually resides in the State Heritage Museum in Rome. Notice the serpent and the staff. Does that look any kind of familiar? Actually, today, the symbol of pharmacies and of medicine 
is this is the staff with the serpent and we're thinking about the things that the Greeks offered the things of self the idols of self and the love of self let's think about what was going on during that time there were athletes there were actors and plays uh, the Greek god Dionysus let me tell you that these plays are not nice there's a lot of things that are going on. There's adultery, there's murder, there's, um, there's just a lot of things that, that are brutal. So I'm thinking about this in my research and God just kind of put on my heart, you know, the word celebrity and famous. That should mean something. Who do we, in our culture today, who do we celebrate? Athletes, actors, poets, playwrights, authors. And I wonder how godly most of the things that we watch are. I know I'm guilty of it. So we're going to go back into the verses. And I'm going to read 5 through 9. And so, let's see. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get someone to, someone else is going down ahead of me. And Jesus said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once this man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. This guy, this man. I've been this man before. This man was a sinner, and reading these scriptures, it implies that he feels really sorry for himself. You know, he is a Jewish man. He has been taught the Torah from a very young age, all of these scriptures about how the one true God, and here he is at the pool, and he is worshiping, worshiping an idol, the God, little G God, of medicine Asclepius and so he is he is really sorry for himself and God asked him Jesus asked him do you want to get well and he's well he has an excuse right because people who feel sorry for themselves they always have a, an excuse uh, he says well I try to get in whenever the water is stirred and somebody always goes in ahead of me maybe he liked to play the victim um, and whenever I say that I've been like this man uh, I had some really bad back issues about seven years ago, and I let it almost completely destroy me. I had so many excuses, and I had so many idols, and an idol is just something that takes you away from God, and we have a lot of them in our culture. Um, anything that would make me uh, forget my hurt, um, any kind of band-aid that I would have. I felt like a victim. I felt like I, because I couldn't, you know, do some things or I was bedridden some of the time. Um, yeah, I couldn't teach my, my kid how to, to ride a bike, those kind of things. Um, I slipped into so much depression that I was in the worst kind of pit of sin that you can imagine. I did all kinds of things to try to make myself feel better, to try to fill this hole um, that I had in my heart. I ruined relationships. I did pretty much every sinful thing that you can think possible. Uh, just trying to get out of this pit, just trying to feel good, even if it was just for two seconds, this depression that came over me. And I would claw, I mean, I think about, you know, those things, the simple nature that I was doing. I was clawing, trying to get my way out. And of course, that's not going to work because you're not idolizing the one true God. You're trying to band-aid over something and you're trying to go in a direction that's not going to help you. Ultimately, it might make you forget for a little bit, but it's not going to help you. And so I'm clawing, I'm clawing and I'm trying to get out of this pit of sin, but my fingernails would break and I would just slide down. And I just kept getting deeper and deeper inside of this pool that I was digging myself. And so I know this man. 
And I hit rock bottom with the sin that I was doing. And Jesus, he reached down and he said, do you want to get well? Because if you really want it, if you're ready to stop the sin, I'm here and I'm the answer. I think I'm grateful every day that he has that kind of mercy. I took his hand and he pulled me right out. I didn't hurt anymore. <laughs> I, don't, I don't hurt anymore. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You don't have to hurt. Turn away. Repent. Honestly, turn away from it. You don't need it. You can't have one foot in or one foot out. If you just take that foot and go with him. How did I do that? I shifted my way of thinking. Um, if my back hurt, instead of feeling sorry for myself, or here we go again, or why is this happening to me, I started to use it almost like a fast. And um, if you've never done a fast before, whenever you don't eat for a certain amount of time, every time that you feel hungry, that's whenever you thank, you thank God. And so every time my back started to hurt, I started to think about the wonderful things that he is doing for me and he has done for me and how he has blessed me. And when I started to do that, and when I stopped feeling sorry for myself, and when I stopped playing the victim, whenever I stopped saying, oh, well, everybody gets in front of me, you know, like this guy did, and I took ownership of my actions, he took away my back pain. I didn't hurt anymore, and he took away my shame, and I wasn't depressed anymore. This, the living water, if I ever feel slippage, if I ever feel a moment of I'm not good enough, or you don't know the things that I've done, or just feeling sorry for myself whenever I go through trials, this right here, this is what saves you. This is the living water. Remember, Carrie said last time about drinking from a mud puddle. Don't drink from that mud puddle. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. This works. Drink and have your fill, and you'll never be thirsty again. So, huh. well, that's kind of my story. And I love in 14, whenever God saves you from something, he tells, he told that man. He went and found him. He, he, he seeked him out, and he said, see, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse will happen to you. Whenever he saves you from something, don't go back. Don't turn into that pillar of salt. Just keep moving forward. Keep in the word. Keep watching with us and Bible nerds. Reach out to somebody in your church, somebody that's a good influence, not someone who is going to validate your victimization or your depression or, oh, I'm sorry, you should feel that way. You know, you want to hear, go to God with it. Let him hold you. Um, there's a lot of times whenever I am feeling some of my my sinful nature or shame or uh, I am going through a trial that uh, I visualize just going to him. I see Jesus and um, and I just put my head in his lap and I let him stroke my hair. I let him tell, tell me, I'm your father. I've got this. You don't need to worry. I have this. Tomorrow I have to worry of his own. Let me take care of you. It's pretty awesome uh, to have that trust in him. So, do you want to be healed? Do you, have you gone through the same things that I've gone through? Have you band-aided with some sort of sin that's going to make you forget for a little while, but there's still this hole in your heart? Do you deal with stress well, problems, depression like I have? You know, you can't control it. <laughs> Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And whenever he asks you, do you want to be healed? Say yes. And accept his mercy because you are worthy and you are beautiful. And that's one thing that I learned, that God thinks that I am precious. I had no idea how much I was loved. You're worth it. And he'll cleanse you. 
He will fill that hole in your heart. And when he does, stay close to his word. Stick with us. Dig in deep. Because it's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's the true way to live, let me tell you. Whew. Okay. Let's change things around a little bit. Because uh, someone once told me that scripture is like a diamond. And you can take the same text and you can turn it another way. And there's this new shiny facing that you'll learn from. So why did this story of Asclepius mean something to John? Why did it go in here? Remember that the Gospel of John was different from the others. Do you remember why? Because he wanted to show Jesus as a deity. He wanted to show that Jesus, yes, he was a man. He was the son of God, but he, I mean, he was God. And so I call making a man with legs that have atrophied for 38 years of paralysis and then go and public, publicly walk, I call that a pretty good miracle. I call that there's only a God that can do that. But remember that not only was he the deity, but he was also a teacher. And he had these disciples that he was teaching, and he had the young John of whom he loved that he was about to send out into the world without him. He was about to send him to Asia Minor. And at that time, remember the Hellenization of the Greeks this Asclepius was everywhere. There was about 400 places, like the one that he brought them to at the pool of Bethesda, about 400. And so John was going to have to tell his story over and over and over again. It was like Asclepius on steroids that he was going to have to do. So he needed this picture. He needed to remember whenever Jesus took him to this pool and he showed him this miracle. And he said, yeah, see? the one true God and he was able to help others with that story he needed it to spread the good news what is the good news how can you spread the good news how can you spread the gospel that there is one God and his yoke is easy all you have to do believe in him for salvation and long for one another that's it love one another I mean how do you spread that Carrie told us last time remember tell your story John went, and he told his story, and we have this, and he's still telling his story to this very day. Spread the gospel, make other disciples, be a disciple, bring others to God. Tell them your story. There's hope in that. Guys, that's all I have for you today. Um, this particular information was just on my heart. There's a lot more information of John chapter 5, so you need to check that out. Um, I want to thank you for having me here. This has been uh, an amazing experience. Thank you for watching, and as always, happy reading. <laughs>